Right. Uh, let's us kick off. Come have a sit down. Have a seat. Um, evening, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the RSA. I'm Andy Haldane, uh, the Chief Executive uh, here, as some of you, I'm sure, know. And it's great to see so many of you here in the great room this evening, as well as those watching uh, at home uh, online. If you're uh, watching online and haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, uh, please do click on the bell, it says here, uh, to make sure you get notifications of all our upcoming uh, events uh, and our replay videos, including of Sebastian this evening. That's my notices out of the way, which is good. It's my huge pleasure to introduce you to uh, this evening's distinguished uh, guest speaker, Sebastian Malaby. Uh, Sebastian, as you probably all know, is one of the world's most admired and respected uh, financial storytellers. I love that expression, actually. Um, not only because it captures uh, so accurately uh, what Sebastian does uh, so brilliantly, but also because, especially in finance, we don't think of that as necessarily being associated with stories, but absolutely when it's understanding uh, any discipline, uh, any profession, even one as abstruse as finance, stories really, really help. Stories really, really matter. And for me, uh, no one illustrates that better uh, than Sebastian in his own uh, work. For example, Sebastian's helped us to understand such exotic financial tribes as hedge funders, uh, venture capitalists, and weirdest of all, central bankers. Um, <laughs> Uh, Sebastian's the former uh, FT contributing editor, a uh, two-time Pulitzer Prize uh, finalist. He's a senior fellow uh, for international economics at the Council on Foreign Relations. Some seats down here. Um, uh, and is the author of several widely acclaimed and read uh, books, uh, including uh, the best-selling uh, More Money Than God, Hedge Funds and the Making of a New Elite, that's the Hedge Fund Tribe, uh, and the award-winning uh, The Man Who Knew the Life and Times um, of Alan Greenspan, that's the Central Banking Tribe, which I used to form part of. He joins us this evening to discuss his latest book on the latest tribe, uh, The Power Law, Venture Capital, and the Art uh, of Disruption. And like its acclaimed predecessors, this book is full of stories, that word again, and personalities. Uh, and tonight, Sebastian will tell us about uh, what those stories reveal about the venture capitalist skill set. And I think, as interestingly, about the venture capitalist uh, mindset. Both, I think, are absolutely fascinating. And it's why I think it's so important we harness the power in this industry uh, to transform uh, lives for the better. Um, Sebastian will kick off by saying a few words uh, about the book with his opening address, then we'll kick around a few easy questions before passing the floor to you, uh, both in the room and online, for the trickier questions. If you're watching uh, the live stream, you can post your question uh, in the YouTube uh, live chat, or on social uh, media using the Twitter hashtag, hashtag RSAventure. We'll try to get us through as many questions as possible uh, by 7 o'clock, where we'll wrap up uh, sharp. Also in the chat, there are a few more seats down here, by the way, you can come pick them up. Uh, you'll find links to get your own copy of The Power Law from our friends at Foils. For everyone here uh, in the great room, you'll have a chance uh, to buy your own book, perhaps even with Sebastian's signature on it, uh, afterwards uh, in the foyer. That will definitely do from me. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the lectern Sebastian Malaby. Well, uh, thanks, Andy, for that great introduction. Um, as Andy said, I am a storyteller, but I thought I would take a, a different tack just in this short time I have at the beginning of this evening's event um, and try to pick out five ideas that sort of jump out from the history of venture capital as I tell it from the financing of 
Fairchild Semiconductor in the 1950s up to the Uber story, the WeWork story, and some of the more familiar recent ones. Um, and my hope is that together these five ideas are going to show you that venture capital is more than just a financial specialty. Venture capital uh, invites you to think afresh about risk and reward and human behavior. Uh, venture capital uh, is an ingenious and productive way of um, driving applied science. And I'm going to call it uh, the third pillar of capitalism. And the best news is that venture capital uh, can work almost anywhere. So big idea number one. Prediction may be overrated. Um, Vinod Koslo, who is one of the uh, most go-getting and successful Silicon Valley venture capitalists, likes to say that the future can't be predicted. The future can only be invented. And it's a provocative idea, maybe a profound one. I'll leave it to you to decide, but it's provocative. And it's worth just thinking about it for a minute. Um, most times when people predict the future. They do it by studying the patterns from the past. So an economic forecaster, for example, might analyze past data on job creation and see that a spike in job creation is followed by a rise in wages. Uh, and so the forecaster will predict wage trends um, tomorrow based on job creation today. Or a criminologist would do the same thing, look at um, the way that uh, job cre creation may have predicted crime rates in the past, if the historical data is telling you uh, that higher unemployment uh, means more muggings, uh, the criminologist will conclude that this pattern will hold in the future more jobs, safer streets, uh, more unemployment, more law-breaking. But think back for a second to Vinod Kosler. What he's saying is that these social science extrapolations that we rely on all the time are not as interesting as they're sometimes thought to be. They anticipate the future only when there is not much to anticipate. If tomorrow is a mere extension of today, why even bother with forecasting? The future, the forces that will really uh, shape the future in a dramatic way, and in particular the inventions that disrupt economies and disrupt societies, these forces are not mere continuations of the past. By definition, path-breaking new technologies break with past trends. Far from conforming to historical patterns, they scramble them. So think about the COVID-19 pandemic, for example. A social scientist could have looked back at past pandemics uh, and uh, attempted to build a prediction based on historical experience. But this would not have anticipated uh, the remarkably speedy invention of surprisingly effective vaccines, which fundamentally changed the course uh, of the pandemic. And you might say, well, OK. In that case, the forecaster's job was to predict the vaccines. But anticipating unprecedented technological breakthroughs is extremely difficult. Inventions bubble up from the primordial soup of tinkerers and hackers, and you can't predict what's going to surface next. All you can know is that the world of tomorrow will be excitingly different. And hence the first big idea that I'm asking you to think about. Things that are probable, based on extrapolations from the past, are not especially surprising and may not even be all that significant. In contrast, things that are improbable can change everything. Big idea number two, not everything is normal. Many phenomena in life follow what statisticians call a normal distribution, meaning that nearly all the observations cluster around the average. For example, the average height of an American man is five foot 10 inches, and two thirds of American men are within three inches of that point between six foot one and five foot seven. What's more, an exceptional man is not actually very exceptional. So a seven foot tall basketball player may sound like a giant, but is really only 20% taller than the average. But the interesting thing is that not all phenomena follow this normal distribution. If we switch from a discussion of the height of men uh, to their wealth, uh, we find a totally different distribution. People who are richer than the average are sometimes vastly richer. Billionaires are about as rare as seven foot tall people, but relative to the average American family, they are 1,300% wealthier. This sort of skewed distribution is an example of the power law, so-called because the winners advance exponentially upwards. 
and explode upwards far more rapidly than they would in a simple linear progression. Once you become a millionaire, your opportunities for further enrichment are multiplied. Become a billionaire, and the opportunities are almost boundless. And getting our minds around power laws and exponential growth is notoriously difficult. It doesn't come naturally. Go back to COVID-19, for example. At the start of the pandemic, it was hard to understand that a, a doubling in the infection rate could be really dramatic. I mean, when you were doubling from two cases out of 100,000 to four cases out of 100,000, you know, so what? You couldn't intuitively anticipate that when it got to, uh, you know, 2,000 people out of 100,000 doubling to 4,000 people, then that uh, exponential growth would seem like a very big deal. But venture capitalists can help us to comprehend this phenomenon of the power law because they grapple with it daily. That's why I call my book The Power Law, because the vast majority of startups that a venture capitalist back ends up failing. Only a small majority uh, get onto that exponential curve. And the best performers generate more profits than the rest of the startups put together. It's a highly skewed distribution. Uh, venture capital is not even a home run business. The venture capitalist Bill Gurley once said, it's a grand slam business. So the second idea I want you to think about is that not everything is normal, and that if you're operating in a power law world, you need to think accordingly. Venture capitalists are consistently backing crazy, ambitious projects, flying cars, cryptocurrencies, futuristic visions of super-fast broadband. It's not because they're crazy, it's because they have no choice. To link back to the first big idea, it's only the improbable projects uh, that have a chance of hitting that proverbial grand slam and making all the returns in your portfolio. In a power law world, the alternative to backing that outlier grand slam uh, is a failure. Big idea number three, don't be embarrassed. So we know from behavioral science uh, that people have loss aversion. They'll gamble to avoid a loss, but they won't take an equivalent risk when reaching for the upside. In a power law business such as venture capital, this loss aversion is a major obstacle. Venture capital is all about uh, reaching for the upside, reaching for the improbable idea uh, you know, that will return more than all of the other 10 or 50 ideas that you back. So venture capitalists have to figure out a way of overcoming their natural loss aversion. How do they do this? Well, when I read the um, speeches and letters and you know, uh, papers of um, the old-time venture capitalists who started the industry in the 50s and 60s, it was clear that they understood the answer intuitively. They grasped that the best way to manage this kind of risk um, is to embrace it fearlessly. There's no point trying to back conservative startups, uh, as I said before, because those will just hit singles and doubles. Um, and so the early pioneers of venture capital gambled aggressively in pursuit of audacious grand slams, fortifying their nerves with the thought that the most you could lose on any given bet was just one times the capital that you put into it. The upside, of course, could be 10x, 20x, much bigger. Recently, the venture capital partnership Sequoia Capital has battled this same instinctive loss aversion more cunningly. When a Sequoia partner writes an investment memo before the Monday morning partners meeting that will decide on whether to do a particular investment or not, the Sequoia partner is required to include a section in the memo that dreams about what would happen to this startup if everything went right. They have to describe how insanely great it could be in the best possible scenario. By building this exercise into their process, the Sequoia partners have given themselves permission to voice their excitement about a deal and to do so with a fullness that would otherwise have been uncomfortable. The idea is that Sequoia won't shy away from moonshot bets if the cosmic potential is spelled out in writing. Describing this innovation to me, the Sequoia partner, Jim Goertz, put it this way. We all suffer from the desire not to be embarrassed, he said, but we're in the business of being embarrassed. And so my third big idea is, when you are sizing up a decision that will be affected by the power law, 
Don't let yourself feel embarrassed. Big idea number four. Uh, culture is malleable. I recently had a conversation with a venture capitalist from India. He had studied in the United States, been to business school there, worked at Intel, and in 2010 he had returned to his native India and started to do venture capital investments uh, based in Bangalore, India. And I'm a historian, I love history, so I asked him to compare the venture capital scene and the startup scene in Bangalore in 2010 when he began and 2022, 12 years later. So he thought a bit and he told me a story about when he had first begun in Bangalore. He said he made a few portfolio investments and then after a few months, one of the founders that he had supported um, came to him and said, I need your help. And venture capitalists like to think of themselves as a service business, they're there to help entrepreneurs. And so the VC said, sure, what do you want? And the founder of the startup said, I want to get married. And the venture capitalist said, well, why are you coming to me about that? Is it me you want to marry? <laughs> and the venture capitalist said, no, I want to marry my girlfriend. But the problem is that my girlfriend's father thinks that entrepreneur equals loser. Uh, and therefore, he is blocking the marriage. But you, Mr. Venture Capitalist, you have standing, you have stature, you've been to MIT, you've worked for Intel, you know the world. If you telephone my prospective father-in-law and explain to him that entrepreneur does not equal loser, he will let the marriage go ahead. So the venture capitalist thought about this. He thought that marriage intermediation services were not precisely the kind of service that he thought he was uh, there to do, but you know, hey, he wanted to help, so he called out the prospective father-in-law, explained that entrepreneur does not equal loser, and the marriage went ahead, everybody's happy. So I said to the VC, no, that's a good story, and how is it in 2022? Are you still providing marriage intermediation services? And the venture capitalist said to me, no. Today, in 2022, all of the prospective father-in-laws in India are watching Shark Tank in Hindi. Uh, and so the culture has changed in 12 years. That's my point I want you to think about uh, in this section. Culture is malleable. And it's not a point restricted to India. Um, when I've given versions of this talk to other European audiences, I often get this pushback. People say, you know, you've told a nice story in your book about Silicon Valley and maybe about China and about how those people out there, they think when they fail, that's a learning experience. I don't know what they're drinking in the water out there, but here in Europe, when we fail, we think it's failure. We don't think it's just a learning experience. It's never going to be the same in Europe as it is in Silicon Valley, they tell me. And I push back. I say to them, look, if Indian father-in-laws can change their minds in the space of 12 years, it can change anywhere. And in fact, Silicon Valley itself is an illustration of the same phenomenon. Back in the 1950s, when venture capital started to, to get going, the classic business book, black business text of the time, was Organization Man, a depiction of how the white-collar corporate culture of the 1950s consisted of joining a company when you left university and working loyally at the same company until your 60th birthday, at which point you retired with a gold watch. There was not much culture of entrepreneurship back then. But then venture capitalists started showing up, started hiring people out of the big corporations to set up their own companies, liberating talent, uh, as I like to say, and the culture shifted. And all of this leads me to big idea number five, uh, capitalism's third pillar. The Nobel laureate, uh, Ronald Coase, identified uh, two great institutions of modern capitalism. There is the market, which coordinates human activity through price signals and arm's length contracts. And then there is the company that internalizes these contracts and has top-down management to direct the deployment of, of human capital. But it seems to me that venture capital-backed startups deserve to be recognized as the third pillar of capitalism. And let me explain why I say this. Venture capitalists have wrapped their minds around the four big ideas that I've mentioned so far. One, they've understood that improbable ideas can be the most significant. The future cannot be predicted, but it can be invented. Two, venture capitalists know that the power law dictates extremely skewed outcomes, reinforcing the case for backing improbable moonshots with potentially huge payoffs. Third, venture capitalists have learned how to fight 
behavioral biases that impede power law thinking. And fourth, venture capitalists understand that culture adapts and therefore it's worth spreading venture methods everywhere. All over the world, venture capital is changing culture, venture capital is liberating talent, venture capital is acting as a machine for manufacturing entrepreneurial courage. And by mastering these four ideas, venture capitalists have created networks that are kind of in between Ronald Coase's two pillars of capitalism. On the one hand, venture capitalists channel talent, talent employees, um, capital, and large customers to promising startups. And in this way, they're kind of replicating the team formation and strategic vision uh, that is found in corporations. But by limiting the amount of money that they hand out each time to startups, that's the stage-by-stage -stage financing that venture capitalists do, venture capitalists force startups to raise fresh capital every few months. And this brings a market test, a price signal, into the process. If investors don't bid for the next tranche of the startup's equity, the price signal will do its work. The startup will close, avoiding the waste of resources that comes from backing R&D beyond the point <coughs> at which success appears plausible. And this blend of venture strategizing and market signals has been extraordinarily productive. Venture capital-backed startups have delivered more progress in applied science than individuals tinkering in garages, uh, more than centralized corporate R&D units, uh, more in an applied science sense at least than government um, R&D and government attempts to pick technological winners. Every year in America, less than 1% of the startups get formed, that get formed receive venture capital dollars and yet uh, venture capital backed companies account for 75% of the wealth uh, generated by uh, IPOs over the past 25 years or so. And because venture capitalists have been so successful in backing startups, they've changed how people work, how they socialize, how they shop, how they entertain themselves, how they access information, how they manipulate it, how they arrive at quiet epiphanies, how they think. And so my fifth big idea for you today is that venture, cap venture capital-backed startups should be given their due. Venture capital should be recognized as capitalism's third pillar. So that's it for now, and now it's time for me to submit from the supposedly friendly cross-examination by the scary smart Andy Haldane. <laughs> Well, thank you, Sebastian, for that uh, tour de force. Absolutely fascinating. And can I start on, on the book? And you've got deep inside this tribe. How did you do that? This act of anthropology that you pull off, how, how do you build trust in this community? So that's a great question. Um, I've confronted this problem with all of my books. And you have to gain trust, trust to get the access, and you have to... Um, really work on that, and that's why these projects take me about five years each time. It's not really that the writing takes forever, it's that the, the understanding the subject, particularly if it's a bit secretive. And the problem presents itself in different forms. So when I wrote about hedge funds, uh, hedge fund people are secretive, they're insular. You know, the classic hedge funder, Lewis Bacon, made a lot of money, bought himself a private island, and the joke was it made no difference because he was so insular already. <laughs> Uh, and so the difficulty with, with hedge fund people was actually to get into the room with them. And once you got in there, then they were very crunchy in explaining how alpha is generated, how high performance is generated. There was no problem about the explanation. The problem was getting into the room. Venture capital is the opposite. Venture capital is all about networking. People love to introduce you to all their friends and write 15 emails saying, you'll enjoy this conversation. And, uh, and then you go and see people. The problem is, you don't actually always enjoy the conversation because the first one or two or three or 15 are actually deliberately superficial, they're kind of friendly and chummy, but eh, you don't really get the juice. So, you know, I was told at the beginning, you know, I would go ask people, why did you take capital from one venture capital partnership and not the other four that were offering you money? And Jerry Yang of Yahoo would say, well, Mike Moritz of Yesakoi, he had soul. So, I mean, I don't think that's really how capital is allocated. Or, or literally, another one said to me, uh, this is uh, Patrick Collison of Stripe, well, I went to see, same guy actually, Mike Moritz, and um, 
when he was coming out of the office with me after we had a chat, he noticed my bicycle. Um, bicycle? You know, uh, yeah, he liked my bicycle. You know, it was quite a nice Cervelo bike, and uh, he asked me my time on the iconic uh, climb in Silicon Valley from the old La Honda Bridge up to the peak, and I said it was 15, 12, and he said, oh, that's pretty good, and so I passed the test of having grit. So, come on, that's a nice story. It's very <laughs> cute. But so that the trick, Andy, was really to go back and to, and to insist and listen and listen and listen and insist on more answers. And after a while, you understood how capital is really allocated. But it, I guess patience and time um, and re-asking the question and going to the umpteenth meeting, knowing that it could be another waste of time, but, but it might also be a gold mine. Very good. I want to um, pick up on the points you made, Sebastian, about um, behavioral biases and leaning against them and how to do that. And you have this wonderful expression um, that, that VC is a, a machine for manufacturing courage. I love that expression. Um, what's inside the machine? How do, you, how do you do that? You know, if we were all seeking a machine for manufacturing courage, whatever we were doing, how do you go about doing that? So I think it is about um, recognizing the biases which you know, the behavioral science people have written a lot about and uh, addressing them. And I gave you one example uh, which was around writing it out in the memo, how great could this become, and, and forcing yourself not to be embarrassed and to put it on paper, how great the upside is. Another example would be you know, in venture capital, the same deal will come back. So you may pass on an investment in a particular startup at the seed stage or the Series A stage when it's a bit more advanced, and then it comes back in the Series B stage. And what some venture capitalists have realized is that because we anchor on our past um, positions that we've taken, we tend to say no to something that we've said no to in the past. It's embarrassing to admit that we were wrong the first time. And particularly embarrassing when all venture capital bets are kind of a one in 10 or something like that, and you know that failure is more likely than success, you're particularly likely to seize on the, you know, the warts on the deal and say no. Um, and so by explicitly recognizing that we anchor, uh, Sequoia trained its internal group to combat that anchoring. You know, the other partners would challenge the lead proposer of the deal. You know, you're saying no, but is that because you said no last time? Are you sure? So I think you can, you can fight it. And when it comes to um, government, can we manufacture courage in government when it comes to innovation? What is the role of the state in all of this? Is it as competitor, is it as a partner? What lessons are there for yeah. government policy? I think that's a great question because I think that you, you have it, one has enormous difficulty in having a government with that degree of courage. I mean. The courage works because, you know, partly you're not afraid of losing, but also you really, really want to win, uh, right? So you're going to stretch for the audacious deal. And then after the deal, you're going to do everything in your power to make it work by providing the introductions and all that. So you, it's the upside incentive combined with, the, with kind of inoculating yourself, yourself against the downside fear that works in private venture capital. And I think in, when the government is the investor, the government tends to fear the embarrassment of losing money more. Um, there was a famous case in the US around solar panels, Solyndra, where you know, the government put, the, the Obama administration bet on this solar panel company, and when it did badly, Republicans made hay over this you know, failed industrial policy you know, for, for months and years after that. So just the political cost of being wrong is high. And I think also the government, you know, government people, by their nature, they're not going to pocket the upside themselves. And so I think it is difficult. So I think the role of government in innovation is important, but it does not lie in being the capital provider. It lies in backing fundamental science, in backing a pipeline of PhD students and postdocs who are doing the fundamental science and who may then spin out into startups. It, I mean, a big thing for the UK to fix is to make it easier to hire people out of big companies. Because right at the moment, you've got you know, startups that raise, say, nine months of um, runway capital until they're going to have to raise money again. They hire the ideal 
you know, chief technology officer or something, and then the CTO says, okay, great, I've got gardening leave for the next six months. I mean, that's, that's a killer. Um, so there are certain policy things around tax and so forth which the UK has got right. Um, I think that point about the mobility of talent is still to be fixed. And on um, one of the points you make in the, the book is um, for all its many virtues, this is not an industry that is especially diverse along any dimension you can think of. Mm. And yet we tell ourselves stories about how diversity is a kind of fantastic thing for creativity and for imagination, for all the things you thought that VC industry does well. What's your own takeaway from, from all of that? And, and would the VC industry do even better if it embraced diversity, I suppose? I think the first thing is, you know, if you are claiming to then invent the future for all of society, you ought to look like society, uh, just as a sort of matter of politics. Uh, and if you don't, um, A, it's bad, and B, you will reap the whirlwind politically, and your, the environment around your business will deteriorate because people will hate you. So I think that's the first thing. You do raise a sort of subtle point about, you know, how are the best decisions made? And I think the reality is, is quite two-sided. There are times when diversity produces multiple perspectives and opens your eyes to things you would have missed, and I, I do believe that. I think there are also times when everybody being on each other's wavelength um, can sometimes mean that in a narrow, you'll probably have a narrow aperture, but you could be very good at a narrow thing. Yeah. So, for example, this is a startup story, not a venture capital story, but when Max Levchin, the founder of PayPal, got into trouble uh, for saying he would only hire computer scientists who had been to the same university, University of Illinois, that he went to. I mean, he got beaten up for that, but it wasn't totally crazy because he wanted people who were operating with the same computer architecture and he wouldn't want to waste time sort of debating whether to use this type of programming language and not that type. So I, I, I think the industry, the VC industry as a whole, definitely has to be diverse. Whether you need diversity within a seven-person partnership, more debatable, but probably is good. Um, and I think, you know, a, a concrete example of what happens when you don't have diversity across the funding sector um, comes from the amazing story of the ox oximeter, ox the thing that measures your oxygen level, uh, which became very important during COVID. And it transpired that this device is typically designed for white skin. And it shines a light through the white skin to, to figure out how much light is going through and measure your, your oxygen level. If you have dark skin, it'll get the measurement different. And so dark skin people were being denied admission to the ICU because the stupid machine was not geared to measure everybody's skin and people hadn't thought of that. And that's a scandal, wow. right? And, um, you know, so that's the kind of thing you absolutely need to avoid and I think you'd be better at avoiding it if you had more diversity in the design team and the funding team. Last question from me and then we'll go to the audience. So get prepared with your questions. I've got a few online already. So, um, this place, the RSA, Sebastian, we're in the social change business. We speak about ourselves as being social innovators, social entrepreneurs. Is this VC model one that we can take transferable parts of and apply it in the social sphere, or is this just for the commercial, do you think? I think a, an interesting person to look at on this question is Bill Gates. Um, in, and I, I think there's one obvious point and one subtle one. The obvious thing is that he structured his climate fighting fund as a venture capital fund. It has you know, money in the fund that is more long term, more patient, because climate projects can be very long duration. If you're trying to create a brand new type of you know, nuclear reactor, which I know somebody who's doing, you raise money from somebody who has a 20 year outlook, maybe not a, not a seven year outlook. So Gates has tweaked the venture model, but he has used it for fighting climate change. He also, in setting up his global health fund, had an explicit vision at the beginning, I remember, because I, I went to talk to him a couple of times when it was new. Um, and the model was, look, in public health, you've got the government, which has lots of money that it puts into public health, um, which is risk-averse for the reasons I said earlier. It's embarrassing if you, if you fail. 
Um, and so the function of philanthropy is to be a bit more risk-taking, to be okay with you know, betting demonstration projects, which, if they worked, could have enormous upside because you could then scale the model. And if they don't work, you're willing to accept the embarrassment of failure. So I think there are things that can be learned for the RSA. Fantastic. I'm going to take some, start to, a few questions from the audience, and we'll start uh, just here. We have some uh, microphones. Just wait for the, the mic, and then we'll go uh, to the back there. If prediction is overrated, does that mean that possibility will get a better hearing in the form of alternative scenarios? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think, you know, most venture ideas, um, when they are first pitched, fail the test of, you know, if you had to make your kind of base case prediction of the most probable outcome, it would fail, right? That would just, by, by definition, in a power law distribution, that's true. The median project fails. Um, and so it's all about betting on not even a likely probability, but something that could happen. And thinking to yourself, look, if this thing happens, and I describe this with the food company, Impossible Foods, right at the start of my book. The, the conversation between the venture capitalist and the entrepreneur was, entrepreneur says, I'm going to get rid of the meat industrial complex by having a vegetarian hamburger, which tastes as juicy and behaves exactly like a beef burger. You can put it on your barbecue, it's going to turn from red to brown, and it's going to have that sizzling smell, which you like from a normal barbecue. And I know, I'm a, I'm a biologist, I know how to do this. And was it going to work? Ah, it's probably a 50-50 that this crazy scientist could really put it off. But if it did work, what would be the upside? Not two to one, but sort of, you know, 2,000 to one. And so if it's a sort of one in two probability of working, but it's an upside of one in 200 or 2,000, of course you bet on it, right? And I think that's the mentality that you learn from venture capital. We'll get at the back there. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, Talk really interesting, like my brain is spinning thinking about um, applying what you've said to, to the work that I do, so thank you. What I'd like to do is uh, take the question that Andy asked last and kind of push it a bit more into the, possibly the gray area, kind of between the traditional economy and kind of social innovation. I guess my hope for the future is that th that business becomes more about people in society than it is about about money, and I think that's a lot of what the RSA uh, talks about as well. And I wonder, from the reflections that you highlighted, whether actually ven venture capital has, it really c could play a role in that, or whether this idea of the power laws makes it really a zero-sum game, where the winds have to be so great and able to almost go into an individual's pocket or a group of individual's pockets, rather than society gaining as a whole, that actually, we can't see it kind of being that force for, for good and that, that kind of move, um, move in that, that different direction. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. I think that it depends on, I mean, th there can be different kinds of venture mentality applied in different areas depending on the type of money that is paying for the venture fund. If you've got a for-profit venture fund, then it's hard to escape the reality that the venture capitalists will want to pocket a lot of upside in the minority of bets that turn out to be moonshot winners. Doesn't mean that those things can't be good for society. I mean, in probable foods, these vegetarian hamburgers are clearly very good for fighting global warming uh, and actually good for health. Um, so there can be social spillovers that are positive. In fact, I think that venture capital unlike most types of finance where there are government backstops for bank lending and all that, where essentially society is paying for the negative externalities from the financial sector. In venture capital, there are positive externalities, there are positive spin-outs. It's the only kind of finance I can think of where the externalities are positive. But then you can have other kinds of venture-type activity where the money that goes in is philanthropic, it's not for profit. And then you can apply the same thinking of, look, I'm going to do lots of social entrepreneurship bets. I'm going to be aware that some of these ideas I'm backing may turn out not to work. Um, but I'm going to, you know, make a lot of them. I'm going to try to measure their performance. And then the ones that really have a good social impact, once I've demonstrated that through my risk-taking venture-type bet, 
you know, it can be scaled by, by the government or by somebody else. So I think you can apply that to not-for-profit thinking, but it would need to be a different source of capital that you use. I take a question from um, uh, online. In fact, a couple uh, on similar sorts of themes from Susan Johnson and from Titus Alexander. They're both about the extent to which, Sebastian, uh, VC could help us navigate uh, the zero, net zero transition. I is this something that can expedite, put us on that critical path, do you think? I do think so. I mean, I, I mentioned earlier with uh, respect to Gates that some climate projects are long duration and traditional venture capital has a kind of seven-year mental model. Um, and venture capital has also gravitated towards the preference for software projects because they take less capital and they can have a very fast uh, scaling up process. But actually, you know, at the early, in the early sort of years that I cover in my book, I tell stories about, you know, funding semiconductors, funding, you know, Apple with its personal computer, funding Cisco's routers, all kinds of, you know, um, sort of infrastructure and hardware to connect up the internet. Uh, and so this was the pre-software era of venture capital, proving that you can have more capital intensive, longer duration projects, which might include some electric battery projects and so forth. Um, there's quite a lot going on in food tech. Um, and so new kinds of agriculture, Impossible Foods is one example, but there's actually many food tech types of project. Um, there's a lot of software that, that manages um, electricity networks more efficiently, sort of um, smart meters and all that kind of stuff to uh, help us to consume less electricity in our homes. And so I think even traditional venture capital can do quite a lot. And then if you add on top of that the deliberately more long-termist semi-philanthropic uh, venture funds like the Gates Fund, um, it can do even more. Um, so I, I am optimistic there. I think there's a question here at the, at the back. Hi. Um, good evening. I have a question about the paradox of entrepreneur, entrepreneurship. Uh, if somebody works at a VC firm, works for an employer, that means he or she is not a founder, uh, is lacking in entrepreneurial spirit, just work for an employer. Um, so their decision will probably be joining the bandwagon, invest in tech or internet or net zero tech uh, rather than investing in non-bandwagon underfunded industries such as agriculture. Uh, how can you foster the entrepreneurial spirit um, in among like VC employees because if you work nine to five in a company, that means those people, they are not entrepreneurial. Otherwise, they will become uh, mm. head of their own fund. So it's a paradox to me. Mm. Um, if more money is chasing a bandwagon, it will drive up return, leading to those uh, socially beneficial uh, industry lacking in funding, such as agriculture amid the food and water crisis. So. Uh, my question is about how do you ensure people in this industry is really um, having yeah. entrepreneurial spirit? Thank you. So uh, it's a good question. I mean, actually, many of the venture capitalists that I write about in my stories are former entrepreneurs. So if you think about the company Kleiner Perkins, for example, Tom Perkins had started a laser company as an entrepreneur and Eugene Kleiner had started um, Fairchild Semiconductor. He was one of the eight people who did that. If you think about, um, you know, uh, Don Valentine, the founder of uh, Sequoia, he had also been um, an operator at various semiconductor companies before he went over towards investing. So you get a lot of entrepreneurs who become venture capitalists. Um, and indeed, when Andreessen Horowitz set up in 2009 and rocketed into the sort of top tier of uh, venture capital companies. Their mantra for a while was that in order to be a general partner at Andreessen Horowitz, you had to have started your own startup before. That was a requirement. Um, and with respect to moving into new fields, I think the VC partnerships are rather quick and nimble. If they see that 
you know, let's say biotech is poised for a takeoff because, you know, gene editing, mRNA technology or what have you is going to create a new golden era for biotech startups. They're going to immediately go and find uh, a great partner with biotech expertise who's done a biotech startup or has worked at one or is really deep into that network, understands the science, and they're going to bring that person in to do the investments. Um, and it's the same with food tech. So I think um, your point is correct, but it's also well understood by the better venture capital partnerships. There's always going to be unimpressive, bad venture capitalists who don't fit your model. Um, I'm aware of that, but at least the good ones do get it. Question online, then I'll go back to the floor. It's a personal one. What is Sebastian most proud to have, to have invested in, <laughs> and why? <laughs> Hope it's on Bitcoin. Gosh, well, my, my personal investments are much less interesting than my, uh, my writings, because <laughs> when you write, you, you don't get paid huge amounts of money to invest. <laughs> Um, so I don't really have a great story about my personal investments, other than, I suppose, you know, investing in my children. That's kind of a cheat answer, I guess. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, We'll start here. Yes, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts about uh, the impact of venture capital on the economic cycles, both the upsides and the downsides. On the what cycles? Economic cycles. Oh, economic, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question for right now, of course, because there's been you know, a big market correction as the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates and tech valuations have collapsed. The NASDAQ is down by 60%. And so cycles are very much on people's minds. I was in San Francisco uh, last week, and um, it's hard to have a conversation that's not about cycles. Um, I'd say that venture capitalists are kind of cycle takers, not cycle creators for the most part. In other words, when you have a tightening cycle from the central bank, money is more expensive, and the hurdle rate for investors goes up, and so money flows less plentifully into venture capital, and in particular because technology involves investing in something which you hope will have value seven years from now. It's a long-duration investment, and so when interest rates rise, you have to discount over seven years, and so the net present value of your investment will be more effective than if it was a near-term outcome. Um, so you see these cycles in venture capital where um, after the NASDAQ crashed in 2000, uh, Silicon Valley went into a, a bit of a sleep for two or three years while not many deals were done after that. The question of whether then in turn the collapse in tech could exacerbate a down cycle is worth addressing now because the tech sector has got bigger. Uh, and so, you know, even in 2000, 2001, I think some of the downdraft in the economy did come from a collapse of tech investment. It turned out that although it's the Wall Street, the financial sector that's interconnected through leverage, uh, the tech sector is interconnected in a different way because tech companies make stuff that's sold to other tech companies. And so there were more interconnections in that ecosystem than people predicted. And when the NASDAQ crashed, the whole thing crashed. And that did create um, a, a big fall off in, in business investment, which you could see in the gross numbers across the economy. Um, so um, I think it could be, but I, I'm still skeptical. I just don't think that VC is a big enough um, segment of finance in sheer numbers. Um, it's very important in terms of impact on productivity, but it's not a big number in terms of AUM. I think we'll... Ah, oh, there, sorry. And then... Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I wondered if you saw more, or in the past 10 years, that uh, more VCs have invested on a balance sheet as opposed to product, which is why more startups have potentially failed, because they've been looking at making 50 million in seven years' time, as opposed to if the product is scalable. So you mean the balance sheet of the startup? Or yes, yes, yeah, as yeah. their forecast. Okay, so that brings up a very important thing. So um, for much of the history that I write about, you know, venture capital was this cottage industry where you did these early stage bets, and if you were lucky and you turned out to bet on Amazon, um, you know, in a couple of years, you know, Amazon would be doing terrifically well. It would do an initial public offering, and the venture capitalists would probably cash out. But then, in 2009, something amazing happened. 
it was right after the 2008 financial crisis, and um, Facebook was trying to raise another bunch of capital. And you know, Facebook, being Facebook, thought, no problem. You know, we're the hottest company in Silicon Valley. We can always raise capital. But actually, the financial crisis meant that all the normal suspects for writing a large check to a private tech company were not writing checks. They were too frightened, and they sent the chief financial officer off to the Gulf states to pass the hat. No can do. He comes back empty hat. And then he's sitting at his desk one day, and he gets this call from Moscow. And the voice on the other end of the line says, hello, this is Yuri Milner. And the CFO says, who? And uh, he says, I'm Yuri Milner. I hear that you're trying to raise capital. I want to invest. Well, Yuri, have you ever been to Silicon Valley? Um, I've never been to Silicon Valley. Well, then stop wasting my time. The CFO puts the phone down. This character, Yuri Milner, actually knows a lot about Facebook because he's founded himself the Facebook clone in Russia. And he puts the phone down, gets his secretary to book him an air ticket, flies to San Francisco, makes a call from the airport to the same CFO and says, okay, now I'm in Silicon Valley, now will you see me? <laughs> and he talks his way into uh, Mark Zuckerberg's office and he writes this huge check for uh, more than $100 million. And within about a year, this turns out to be an amazing win. And thus is born the new kind of venture capital, which is not small checks of like, you know, 10 million or so to a very early stage company. It's 100 million, 200 million to an established tech company. And then you get this new term, unicorn, which people didn't talk about until about 2013. Um, but that's the origin of the unicorn, this character, Yuri Milner, who jumps on the flight from uh, Moscow to, to San Francisco. And then comes what you're talking about, which is, it's no longer so much of a power law business because you're investing these big checks into uh, not really startups, but established tech companies that haven't done an IPO. They've delayed the IPO. And you can see their cash flow, and you can project the cash flow, and you can make a bet on where it's going to be. And you know the entrepreneur is an established and sort of serious person because they've already grown it for the last seven years or eight years, and they've done really well. And so it's a totally different kind of investing. And that is why the aggregate numbers for venture capital have ballooned um, in the years up to 2022. I mean, it's crashed, I mean, it's different now. But through COVID and even the years before COVID, you had this whoosh of venture money going in because actually it wasn't traditional venture money. It was this new kind. So I do think you're right that it's this balance sheet kind of financing in the more established tech companies because of delayed IPOs that explain why VC has grown so much. Yes, just uh, um, I, I think the point you make is, is about uh, venture capital being a fundamentally a force of good uh, above and beyond its uh, pursuit of, of, of investment growth and, and profit. Um, and I'd largely agree, but equally, um, within the context of like crypto, mm. um, which has had a massive impact in terms of energy consumption, e-waste, et cetera, et cetera, mm. what could or should government do uh, in terms of guiding or influencing venture capital to not invest in technologies that are highly profitable but potentially toxic? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And, you know, crypto is one example people cite. You could say that, you know, social media has got to a point where there are these big downsides. Um, uh, and, uh, well, I mean, not you could. You c you, it's definitely the case that there's got downsides. It's also got some upsides, so where, the, where it nets out is, is the bit that one can debate. So what should government do? My view is that when startups are being formed and venture capitalists are most crucially involved, um, it's impossible really to predict the social consequences of, of the idea. And it's pretty difficult to predict anything about the startup. Right, um, but, but being precise about those consequences and where they would net out good versus bad is impossible. So you shouldn't regulate those early bets. What you should do is regulate the companies when they get to be of a size, where they are having a significant social impact, and then you regulate them. And in fact, in a way, if you don't like big tech because of the negative social impact, you should love small tech which is disrupting big tech. Of course, one of the big problems with big tech is you get these monopolistic platforms that are not very competitive. So you want the new disruptors to, to get in their way and trip them up. Um, so I think that the first point is don't 
put sands in the gears of the early stage company formation. With crypto, I would say that you know, this point holds. The right way to deal with the environmental fallout is obviously a carbon tax, which we should obviously do for many, many good reasons. But one of the things it would do is make these crypto miners pay more tax and do less mining, right? Um, uh, and with the social fallout from um, social media, you know, if there are good data suggesting that it's, you know, causing depression amongst teenage girls, I actually think the data on that is not very good. But anyway, if there were good data, I would be in favor of intervening and regulating. Time is almost uh, up. I'm sure there'll be a chance to speak to Sebastian uh, afterwards. Final question, though, from me, Sebastian, before we, before we wrap up. Um, you've told us that predictions are mugs game. And, um, <laughs> Uh, 30 years too late in my case. <laughs> but never mind. Um, so, um, paint is a, a picture, an invention, a discovery. It, so, so, what is this big societal challenge you think that the VC industry could help us tackle? Peering into the middle distance, if you're picking a societal challenge that VC could get its teeth into, which one would you pick? I think the two areas with the biggest uh, social impact are the environment, which we've talked about, where I do think that VC can do quite a bit. Um, I mean, just I'll give you a story about that. I was, when I was in San Francisco last week, I met um, somebody who had spun out of MIT and was working on a new generation of fusion reactor that he honestly thinks could replace all other electricity generation in the next 15 years. Um, and his vision is, you've got all these electricity generations, some of them are coal-fired, some of them are gas-fired, and he's going to go to these power plants and say, I love your power plant, I love the way you're connected to the grid, I love lots of things about it, it's just that boiler that has a problem. Let me take away your coal-fired thing and plug in my brilliant new form of nuclear one, and uh, no more emissions. And he has the energy companies investing in his company so that he's got them on side. And he's got lots of credible people backing him. He's raised $2 billion, right? So people believe in this. It's not impossible. It's not a certainty, but it's not impossible. So I think that's a huge thing. And I would just say healthcare is the other area that I'm excited about. I do think that, you know, the mRNA vaccine of Moderna was a venture capital backed um, startup. And I think that unlocking of the potential of gene editing, um, we may, we're just seeing the start. We should definitely wrap up. I apologize for those who haven't got to uh, get to, to your question. You can ask your question while you buy Sebastian's book. <laughs> uh, I'm not on commission, regrettably, um, but he'll be signing them uh, outside uh, in the foyer just there. For those online, the book's available uh, through the link in the the link in the chat. Thank you all uh, so much uh, for coming along both in the room and online to participate and please join me in thanking Sebastian for absolutely fantastic and fascinating. <laughs>